Todd, are you coming? I'm starting right here. Yes. This is an ID quiz, too, so get that sheet to fill out. Yeah, my sheet's in the office. Mine's a big tree. some of the trees that have been around here for quite a while. And there's a lot of diversity that I think we often overlook. But one of the new plants, and I want to point out this magnolia, this is a saucer magnolia. And I don't know how we could have better timing other than it would be in full bloom, which might be this afternoon with the heat that we're having. But here, those large flower buds are just coming out. And this is a very young tree. I think it was just put in last year. Uh, and we'll look at another one that's labeled down by the library. And I want to point it out because the one down at the library has suffered some damage. And we'll talk about that. It was hit just at the right time. And it depends on where the plant's being placed. Is that sometimes that cold snow that we had, it wasn't very favorable on that one down there. But this one came through just fine as well. So we're always battling the things that go on in the landscape where one neighbor it's okay and the other neighbor you know get some damage on things. But a very popular plant. Uh, one of the things I always get with the students is yes, ask any questions. Yes. Is that a magnolia? A magnolia? Saucer. Saucer magnolia. Yeah. Uh how do you spell that? Which part? Saucer? Yeah. S A U C E R. Why does it have that in the name? The flowers open up. Oh, oh. How big is so is it a, the flowers? is it an the annual, biennial, yeah, perennial, what or? getting to there is that you can have a single trunk, or you can have a multiple yeah. trunk like this. So when you're going out and looking for one, uh, you'll probably see more of the multiple trunk ones because our trend with people and landscape plants is now they like to have multiple trunk plants. Mm -hmm. And here we have a, this is a hydrangea over here and it has two trunks and that's just kind of the trend now. We'll see another plant down further that's that way too. I prefer the single trunk magnolias. So you want to know how big it is. Right in the, about the 25 foot range. It's kind of a medium size. And the other thing that's variable on these is there's a lot of different cultivars because they're hybridized. So some are going to be smaller. It's always good to ask a lot of questions out there shopping for especially these spring flowering trees are so popular now and even the shrubs too I know it's Arbor Day but I count the shrubs in with Arbor Day also I like to point those things out but if you have any questions on any plants just bring them up as we go around it's hello day. hello Todd as well as Arbor Day yes so what's that M word for more than three growing seasons growing I said multiple trunk Multiple trunks. Yeah, multiple trunks. Like this one, gal, it's going to have like three at least, maybe four. <laughs> and you always can have that option of eliminating one if you don't want to have the four. Three looks more pleasant to the eye is what they say. So that's our first one. Let's go ahead and weave around here. We can spread out more here. Yeah, some of the plants have really taken off. Now others are lagging behind. What is that? So we're yeah, we'll address that here. So these, this is really the traditional annual beds of the Trick House Garden. So I can really walk around these and not feel guilty at all because they will eventually get annual put in it. And a nice caveat to that is uh, our students graduating here in May 
has taken care of this garden for four or five years. Mm -hmm. And uh, <coughs> Stephen's graduating, and he took on this project as, you know, one of those old side jobs. Mm -hmm. And he's really kind of built a reputation of uh, this being his first garden that he's involved with. Well, now he's over at Lawrence and Gardens, and he's working over there for the past year, year and a half. It's one of our many success stories. So anyway, I know we got to focus on trees, but I know you're going to wonder what is, what is that sound? Out there? I know David Charles is asking, what is that what thing? Is and you haven't cut it down. Well, they kept it in the middle just for some texture out here, but it's penicetum, the purple penicetum grass, and it gets big. So I don't know what they're going to put back in there, but it was successful last year, and they might be putting that back in there. I haven't seen the plan on it. So this is always really formal, but as you get outside here, with some of the uh, bones of the landscape, I like to call them the shrubs and the trees, then that stuff becomes a little more informal. So, two trees I want to point out, because they're the conifers. Uh, the big one over here on the right is our Austrian pine. And now when I usually say Austrian pine, there's some people that sigh. Oh, because Austrian pine are the ones getting hit by that. This one's still healthy. Not I shouldn't point it out because maybe I'll change it. There's nothing we can do about it. And this is an old tree. This goes back to the early days of the forest. Uh, that was placed over here. So there we have one from Europe. But what I love in teaching is that when I talk about uh, the conifers and the pines all the way around, I always mention our native ones. Native one in Nebraska, Ponderosa pine. <laughs> Thank goodness. Right next to the Austrian, so yes, we haven't had a lot of harmony here. <laughs> the one has really affected the growth of the other, but the Ponderosa pine, which is native to our sand hills, um, it doesn't get pine wilt. We haven't had any pine wilt disease problems with it yet. So it's one that I've always been promoting yet as far as that's an option for you, and we offer it to our So Ponderosa is still one of those that I stand behind. We haven't seen any problems. Will we? I don't know. But uh, other ones that are more closely related haven't had kind of trouble with you. So we have an introduced one where we have to Right here, this has withstood the test of time too, but this is the uh, Colorado cedar, the scopolorum. And it's different than our red cedar in that it usually has a little more blue-green color to it. And as you can see, we've lopped off a, a few limbs on the thing as time has gone with these. They generally have a lifespan for garden areas until they kind of get out of hand on us for 30 to 40 years, sometimes 50. And that one back there behind the trip house, it, it had some character to it, like clouds, the way the uh, foliage is. That's our native red cedar. So the uh, Colorado cedar is a little more upright versus our native one. And it just happens. Anybody that knows, I don't know uh, the background on this one here. It's right behind David Charles. That happens to be a selection, a Nebraska selection of a red cedar from Taylor, Nebraska, and its own. It's very upright in Columbia, and it's called Taylor for Taylor, Nebraska. And it, actually, when you see it mature, it looks like an Italian cypher. We can't grow Italian cypher very well, but that's the type of that's the cedar in all the paintings that have been put in. We'll have them face down in the Italian art and all that. Well, that's kind of our version of what we can get eventually that will give us that kind of effect. That thing will get to be 40, 50 feet. Well, and I love it in that space, though. I, I like having them put that there because that is going to look perfect when it gets up in about 10 years, 15 years where it needs to be. And see, this is something I keep doing. All right, put it in the spot for a while, and then when it doesn't start working out anymore, cut it off. But I know they become members of the family, and you can't cut them off. <laughs> but I try and teach the students to say, hey, it'll serve its purpose, it'll look neat, people will love to talk about it, and then you 
can move on and just take it out. No. And they just left it there or get ripped out. And they'll bring in a new... Yeah, no. It, it can't survive the winters. Penicetum, it's the purple leaf penicetum. It uh, gets big. It was really healthy, as you can see. So is he going to use this for mulch? Basically, is that why they left it? He le I think he left it. I have to quiz him. Um, I think he left it just for the texture of this in the garden. And sometimes we're kind of uh, crafty and we leave it so people ask questions about it. <laughs> exactly. Because they'll say, hey, did you have that in there last year? And it reminds you, yeah, we had penicetum here and that that can be conversation pieces. And we do do that on purpose. Uh, some other things around here, I love the layers. For one thing, that smaller crab apple, if we would go on the opposite side over there, coming in the bloom, and a lot of the other crab apples aren't that far along yet. So that's one of the first ones I've seen in our campus coming to bloom. We have lilacs here. I like layers. We have the big trees, we have the smaller trees that we have here, the lilacs are over here, Myers. And then, of course, we have privet that lines this here, that we go ahead and clear the edge. And then it goes down to the current, which is even smaller. So having this here on campus is always great for teaching in that we see traditional ways of uh, maintaining plants all around. Uh, the last thing I'll point out here before we move down, I talk a lot. So, say, hey, let's go, let's move on, because I keep talking and talking, so you'll help me in that regard. But that plant that's growing on the trellis, it is a clematis, and it's the sweet autumn plant. It's always one that I point out because it's a great one for the garden. We have the other large flowering clematises that bloom during the summer, right? This one here blooms only in the fall and it's very fragrant. So they have that trellis all the way up to the eave, as you can see. It will fill that whole area. It didn't quite do it last year. It was pretty close. But it'll fill that whole area during the summer and then it'll be covered with white in the fall of flowers. And the bees and the insects just are all over it. They have to trim all that dead off of it? They should, but it grows so vigorous that it'll cover it all up. So it kind of gets taken down about halfway every year. It gives a little bit of sturdiness to hold on to. Yeah, yes, bit. sure does. That is a climbing rose. <laughs> this one? Yeah, sweet autumn. Yeah, very fragrant, very hardy. It will, as you can see, it's coming from the base. There will be years that it will go ahead and have die back all the way to the ground or the base, and it'll soil line, and it'll just come back the next year for you. So you can prune all that away, and you're off to the rain. Great, great. I don't know which one. All I know is this. south end of campus that was a monster why was it called that the honeysuckle it's, it's flowers very fragrant why was it called a monster and they tore it out wasn't good it was just so big they were having a hard time maintaining it. that plan is a dutchman's pipe it's 
root hardy, so it dies to the ground too. And it does get a flower that looks like a little Dutchman's pipe. <laughs> so it's Aristolochia is the genus on it. And I'm really curious about the sorts of that plant. That one could be the same as the clematis, that it's yeah. ancient. Can you buy something like that? Okay. Propagating those? Yeah, they, they will put on new growth. And in June, you can root them in the That current growth that you have, uh, using some of that uh, rooting hormone. I think you'll have to give permission, and I can't give it to you. Sorry, but here in the middle of the night. But we can find out. No, nope. hey, I, I, I don't want to do that all the time. It's just that I don't want to ask. Yeah. Take a cut and take a while. We'll talk. Okay, let's go that way. We're going to go on down the hill into some tree diversity down here by building 9 and 8. Doing the shearing through the summer. Yeah, it'll be at least once a month. The, uh, the little plant to take home. Oh, I don't see. <laughs> you know what? The, uh, I don't have any little plants of it. The foliage, if you want to have an idea what the foliage looks like. There you go. What time is lunch? Noon. Yeah. All right, we're eleven oh seven. We'll do okay. Sort yes, <laughs> I think so. There's some we didn't put signs on, and this is one of them. What were the signs for? They're in, we'll uh, hit a sign down here. I'll, it, it gives information on the sign. But I picked this area. It was really close for one thing. Otherwise, I'd be dragging all over campus like I do. So I think it's partly an exercise class, too. <laughs> Plan ID, cross-reference with exercise. But this one we didn't tag last week, but I cannot help myself. We've got to stop because it's in full bloom. This is a service berry. And it's a big one. It's called Arborea service berry, or the tree service berry, because of its size. It's really considered a shrub, believe it or not. So, um, got to stop tree, what? Like, what's that? Got to stop what? Stop. Oh, I just wanted to stop and see a flower. 
Oh. And if you if you can focus, I'm not used to this much sunlight here. <laughs> so with the sun on here, if you focus, you can see the insects doing their thing. Little bees, you see them hanging out. This stuff does have a little fragrance, and it is in full bloom. And the service fairies are really popular. They're native to the U.S., and it's a really nice landscape plant. In which state? They're all through the east uh, part of the United States. Eastern part. This happens to be a really big one. Yeah, they don't usually get this big. No, either. they're usually in this side. And this is one that's native in the Midwest called Canadensis. Is there a reason it's the species? Yeah. Why does it this have service in the name? And this one's Arborea. So that's the difference. They're cousins, is what they are. So, Todd, these yes. service berries, why do they have service in the name? Service berry? Because of the time they flower. Oh. That was a great question. Yeah. David does that. <laughs> so, service berry. And it's all centered around our Easter service. Oh. Yeah. They bloom around that. Yeah. It leads into, that's horticulture common names on plants. There's always something behind it, usually. And service that they're usually in bloom about that time. And we're off a little bit, but okay. Yeah, we have ears on that. Yeah, we're close. We're in the ball game. Okay, let's go down to this one. What are you doing? Very concerned about what I do. Um, what was so, that you peeled off? This is the bark, peeling bark of river birch. Some of you probably have river birch, probably in your landscape. Yeah. Nope, not me. Very popular, very popular because of this. That it has that peeling bark. It doesn't actually. It's flowering right now. See those little chains hanging down? That's the pollen. So if you it's a good thing we can't reach it because I'd be hitting them and the pollen would come out and then pretty soon we'd have sneezing and all that. So it actually is in flower right now. They're not showy because they're wind pollinated. So insect pollinated, wind pollinated. And that's why the chain came down so the wind blows it and makes us miserable. Right? Why does it do that? That's the way they're pollinated. And it's kind of slow to start leaping out. Very popular, like I said. Uh, this one probably has too many trunks. I like to have three on these again. Uh, so, Where are the trunks on that? What's that? Where are the trunks? This, that's the trunk. Oh. The stem. Oof. You're going to need our, a our saw to cut those the excess... Tree. Just a minute. This river birch tree gives back $1,485 worth of environmental benefits over the next 15 years. It prevents soil erosion, reduces energy costs, improves air quality, increases property value, and reduces carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide. Whiter bark? Yeah. yeah. Does it have any brown bark in it, or is it just completely white? Uh, toward the, the bottom, where it's a, a little older, it's a little, a little thicker. A darker. little like that. Yeah. Okay. It's still a river birch, but it's probably a different cultivar. There's different, there's different cultivars of them. It gets a little closer than cousins. Now you have siblings. Yeah. Wow. So cultivars selected like the one that's most popular is called Heritage River Bird. And that's the special selection for the whiter bark. I think that's what you have. That's a little whiter bark. It's still a river bird, but it peels a lot, doesn't it? Yeah, it's for the peeling too. So we get crazy enough to we sit here and stare at them. And if one peels a little bit more, we say, hey, that's the one we're going to prop. Ridiculous. Why does one peel? do that. Not all, but most. Go ahead and do that. And this one, it's, it's just the nature of the bark on this. That's how it... It grows out of peeling so much as it gets more mature. Yeah. Yeah. And the difference is different. Yeah. Okay.
Okay, let's go over this one. What is that? It's the flowers from last year. So, Japanese pagoda. The pagoda tree. Does anybody have one of these? I'm going to say that for everything. Not me. This is a little more unusual to have out there. I usually see them in Omaha in parks. If you go to a nursery, the one that you will generally see to buy is one that's weeping. Right. It's a weeping. You've, you've seen that, haven't yeah. you? Well, this is the regular way it's supposed to be. And so I'm holding up what last year was the flowering part of it, the inflorescence. And you can see them still hanging on there. They are going to shed those. And they don't look really too pleasing now. They're, uh, they still have the seed in there. They're a little bit yellowish. The yellowish green are on that side of color, but... I want to hold this up and have you look at them still hanging on there because those are white flowers here later on in the beginning of the summer. So when this thing comes into flower, it's a showstopper. This whole panicle is filled with light. So you start looking and going, wow, there's a lot of flowers that's been produced. And it's kind of a medium-sized tree. It isn't a huge tree. It's medium-sized and it likes to spread out. It's not the best specimen. But it's our pagoda dog, or pagoda, uh, Japanese pagoda tree that we have. What part of Japan was it originally grown? It's grown in a lot of areas of Japan. It's native there. And then it also goes into China. But we can't grow it in Nebraska, can we not? Here. Yep. <laughs> we got it. So anybody that likes seed, and actually, look, right here. These are little ones coming up. Little... Japanese pagodas. What day and month? <laughs> Todd? Yes? What day and month can we plant the Japanese pagoda? Right now. Right now, in April. April 25th? Yep. Gotcha, thanks. Yep. Wow. Why is it called that? Because it has black walnuts. Inedible? No, they're edible. Very hard. Yeah. And the squirrels yes. love them. What are the health effects on humans? No health effects. Yeah. Does it look cool? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah you'll have, especially if they flower at the same time, you'll have different we'll have a lot of purple big flowers. So here we have black walnut. It's not a landscape tree as far as what I would say, put one in your yard, okay? Because yes, they get these nuts on them unless you like gathering that and it has that brown, black husk on it and all the other things. But I like to point it out because it is one of our kings of our Midwest forests that we have, but they've been logged out so much that we're missing a lot of that out there. So this is the tree that the beautiful black brown walnut wood comes from. And we have that unique processing plant over here in Council Bluffs. And it's uh, Midwest Walnut is what it's called. A lot of people don't even know it exists, but it processes a lot of walnut out of the whole Midwest. And you know what the majority of it is going to? This was one of their biggest customers when I was there about five or six years ago. Lexus steering wheels. Oh. Oh. So let me. Lexus? No. Neither do I. But, hey Todd. Yeah. So the black walnuts they aren't high in protein. No, they're they're good for you. They're just a different taste. Does anybody like black walnut meat? I have never tried one before. Can only eat so many. Really hard to crack. Okay, where can I buy a nutcracker for that? Hammers work. Uh, on the internet. <laughs> Let's go to a smaller tree up here. This is a small tree and it really has a lot of character to it. It's an American horn bee. And it is native further east of here, but it grows fine in Nebraska. It's, I'm glad to have so many people on the walk because we need more of this kind of stuff planted out there. Todd? American horn beam. Yes. Why does it have horn and beam in the name? It has to do with the way the fruit ends up coming out because it, it has this kind of lantern that has nothing to do with a horn or a beam, but it's tied in with the way the fruit is. So with this lantern, it doesn't light up? No, it doesn't light up. It's seed. The seed is in the lantern. Okay, so. You know, the flowers are inconspicuous. So they're, you really don't plant it for the flower. It's the shape, it's the size. And then with time, see how the branches are? Yeah. And they start, they're not, no branch is perfect around it. But this thing, with time, starts getting muscle-like looks to the branches. And you can kind of see that happening here. This is a young one yet. And so, as far as the character in the shape, it's really globe-shaped and smaller. And it has really nice, whenever it gets leaves on it, foliage. That's what it's for. And it gets fall color. I'm a big fan of fall color foliage. And so we'll get this orangish red. Why is that? Just the uh, characteristic of the plant. Why are you a big fan? I love it. <laughs> so the fruit, <laughs> so Todd, the yeah. fruit is inedible? Inedible, yes. Is that one you can get parked quite often? Like a quick thrower? We're getting, there's more, mm -hmm. yeah, there's more of them being put out. Mm -hmm. so yeah, it's choking apart. I guess one of the things, one of its relatives, I talked about siblings mm -hmm. and cousins, mm -hmm. one of its cousins that's been showing up in some of our street plantings is a real narrow one, very upright, and it is a uh, American hornbeam light plant. I was trying to say that. I don't need it, but I don't know why I was I'll trying to say it. I had it underneath my armpit. <laughs> uh, underneath your armpit. So it is a hornbeam, it's just Ew. a different species. Okay. Maybe I shouldn't have had you record this. So is it easy? I beg your pardon. <laughs> Next tree. <laughs> is it easy to uh, grow? Bro, yeah, it's just a little slower. We're always so impatient yeah. that putting in a, a smaller tree and then when these other ones are growing faster, you're going, what's wrong with that thing? It just naturally is slower, but it's worth the wait. Because it's very good. We need more diversity, too. There's too many of the same thing being planted out there, but the diversity helps us in the 
times of when something gets attacked. Well, we finally get an oak. I like oak. This one has a little higher value, $1,900, almost $2,000. Why? Where's Whitney at? Whitney, I'm curious on those uh, figures you have on that. Todd? Tree Campus. Just a minute. Uh, Arbor Day Foundation paired with Tree Campus USA yeah. um, to do the research for those. So essentially, if you're wondering about trees in your home or in your neighborhood, if you measure and then plug in, if it's in residential or a large property, commercial property, you can plug in the type of tree. The diameter, I believe it is, and it gives you economic benefits. So, storm water, storm water runoff. Okay. Uh, uh, the benefits to how it absorbs air pollution by providing shades, it may decrease energy. Everything. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's cool. That's so, based on the size and the species, mm -hmm. yeah, all those things. That's neat. Todd. So Whitney did all of these signs for us. Wow. wow. I need to keep pointing those out. This oak is really a unique oak. It's called shingle oak. Why is it called that? Shingle oak because it has a smooth margin. Oaks, the margin of a leaf is the outside edge. And what do we know about most of the oaks on the edge of the leaf? They're always wavy or they're very... Um, serrated and all that kind of stuff. This one's smooth and I keep looking to see if I can find one from last year. It doesn't look like an oak leaf. Oh, okay. And so when you point this out as an oak to people, they go, you're crazy. That doesn't look like any oak I've ever been around. Yes, Todd? It is like that. Good. There you go. Does that look like an oak leaf no, to... No. I don't think so. There? No. Why does it have shingle in the name? I can't say. I just know it's because the margin is smooth. Oh. It looks oh. like the shingles on a house. They're smooth. Okay. There you go. And I always like oaks because of the structure. They have nice branch angles. Well, we know the wood is really tough. They're a long-lived tree. That's another thing. Besides the black walnut, this is one of the most long-lived trees we have in the landscape. So strong it can't be cut down by a saw or an axe? Yes, it can. But long lived as far as being 200 years old out there. It can get to that age. Yeah. Two centuries. And I'll just point out while we're standing here, we're under the shingle with the regular habit that it has. That really upright one over there is an English oak, a newly planted English oak. I think it's only been in the ground two years. But you notice the habit of it, right? Those really upright branches. Okay, here's a little lesson thing. That thing looks great as far as the shape, but the branch angles are horrible for being able to take a snow load or ice or down the line for its health. So you see those types of trees with that really narrow branch angle uh, characteristic as not being very long lived for us in the Midwest or in our area because of our weather. So these are more long lived in those narrow ones, that happens to be in English, uh, break down over time. So let me get this straight. Uh, why is it horrible? The branch angle. Oh. Okay, let's over here. $3,300. Wow! Yeah. And this one's starting to leaf out. We finally have something that's starting to leaf out. And this has compound leaves, so it has leaflets to it. This is native to the U.S. too. It's like Tennessee, Kentucky, Ohio. This is yellow wood. Because of the yellow color inside? You got it. Finally. When you would go ahead and cut into the wood, it has this yellow color to that inner wood. Up. In the center? 
But I love the shape, yes, in the center. And the other thing is it flowers here in the spring really cool. Similar to the pagoda, Japanese pagoda tree. Uh, and this one's white, and then there's a pink color bar. So we can have pink flowers or white flowers. And the other thing I like about it is it's smooth bark. But it kind of has this growth habit that the branches like to grow into each other. You notice that? Yeah. Not a good thing. It, it doesn't, because here, see how this, that's a bark inclusion. But I would normally say, you know, avoid a tree that does that, but don't avoid this one because it tends to survive no matter what. It has that characteristic that it wants to do that, but it does really well in our land. Odd. And we need some more of them. Yes. You know how it comes up and there's like a, a ring that goes around it? Where at? Oh. Yeah, like that. There's this is the one I was looking at. Oh, you mean right here? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, that is characteristics of that younger stem where you have node and inner node areas. The node is where we had our buds, like here on the younger stem, where we would have had that. And not all of them will show up, but some spaced out. So go ahead and, yeah, they'll carry on, like right here. Oh, okay. And then there. And there's one on the main trunk, too. Yeah, that can be from. <laughs> that's a good observation. Now, back on that uh, river birch, the way that bark is, those lines and stuff, they call those lenticels. And that, those ones, that's why that peel is because the lenticels kind of make that thing flake off. Different than this, of course. But I always like the color, I like the flowering, I like the shape, and all the seedlings pretty much are always this way. Are these related to like magnolias at all? This one isn't, but there is another tree. Have you heard of a tree called the tulip tree? Sure, oh, yeah. I love tulips. Tulip trees are in the magnolia family. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, neat leaf. Very, we don't have one close by. That was a good one to Do they grow well here? I know from the they grow fine. Yeah. Yep. Todd, what are the main causes of soil erosion? Soil erosion <laughs> is, uh, oh, a lot of things. Slope, you know, and the way that we drain water off of buildings and all kinds of things like that. Tilling the ground too much. See, that's where the trees hold the soil, and then we can alleviate some of those problems that we have. I know... We put a sign on that one right there, but I already talked about it because it's the same as that one. That's why they look the same. They're cloned. They're exactly the same DNA. That one is Genetically that one. identical? Genetically identical. Interesting. So that was the English oak. And I kind of trashed it by saying, don't get one with branch angles. But what you're really saying is plant some trees. You trashed it? Why? <laughs> Todd? Why'd you trash it? I just seen them with the branch angles have trouble, but we still need to talk about that stuff. Okay, this way, I hope I'm not missing any signs here. Red maple. Yep. Why? Why does it have that red in the name? Right there, the red flowers. Why does that it have flowers. maple in the name? And then the it's leaves a maple. in the fall on this tree. But it doesn't beautiful. produce maple syrup, right? No, not this one. You can get some syrup out of this one, but it takes more. How long? How long what? Will it take? Oh, you could you could tap the thing anytime and gather the 
the uh, water. It looks like water, and then they boil it down. We're talking about tapping the tree for syrup. So it is a maple. And uh, the thing, wow. <laughs> He knows we're talking about it. That's interesting. It's <laughs> yeah, talking to us. So with the maples, and I kind of picked on this one. At um, Todd, that, they don't are, speak. Yeah, I know. In their own way. Okay. So we were talking about sugar maple has the most sugar content, and that's why we tap them to get syrup, and we boil that down, right? You could tap this one and collect that solution, it looks like water, and boil it down, but it doesn't have as high of a sugar content as sugar maple does. So it tastes terrible? No, it just tastes more. How do we improve the taste? No. That's, we just get sugar. So, we're at the red maple, and right over here is the silver maple. And that's when everybody should go, boo! No silver maples. Why do they have silver in the name? The get too big, the leaves are silver, we have them break down and fall down on us. But you know what, in our wisdom, we took that one and crossed it with this one and made that tree. That's the hybrid between the silver and the red, and they call that one the Freemanii hybrid. So those maples now that you can go to every garden center in Omaha, if you say, I'm interested in maple, they're going to take and go, here, come look at this one right here. That's the one. Todd? Is that good or not? You know what? They're really young in the industry yet, but the thing that you can't uh, argue about is they get excellent fall color. Mm -hmm. They are they are really vigorous in their growth, and they get excellent fall color, and that's what people are calling in love with. So, Todd? Yes. Why, did that, why does that maple tree have silver in the name? Silver leaves. Underneath the leaf, it's silver or whitish. Not the metallic element silver? No. All right, back to the red maple, though. It is already forming seeds. Can you believe it? So red maple, a week ago, it had, even though the flowers are little, there's so many on it that it has this red tinge to it. And you can still see some of that. What's a tinge? Well, just this red cap to it the way the color is. And so this, some maples are able to bloom and then form seed right away in the spring and others wait till fall to ripen their seeds. And this is the spring one. We have those good And we know silver does it in the spring, right? And there are bigger helicopters that get in the gutters and you know, planting beds and everything else. I'm a real big fan of straight red maple. I love it. I like the, this is out in the open. It's a great shape. It has, these blue it has a really nice attractive leaf, which looks like a tulip flower, the way the leaf is shaped. And then we get some fall color. So, whenever you have that many things, you get good value. How old is this one? I mean, they typically get this big? Yes, bigger. Bigger. Yeah. And this one, uh, it's probably 35. 35 years yes. old? <laughs> right in there. I really like the maple, and I like using a lot of different ones. Why so, is that? Just go ahead and spread that word amongst everybody, because we don't, need, we don't need to have our whole community filled with that one. And the silver like the maple, you mean? The uh, hybrid. Why not? That's the number one selling tree in Omaha right now, is that one right there. Why don't you want to have that? We want diversity. So why are you a big fan of maple? You said you love uh, like the maple, right? Why is that so? They do well. Korean fur. Yeah, not very valuable. It's Little. young. It's 810. <laughs> 810 years old? $810. 810 dollars, right. Yeah, it's oh, baby. When will it be full grown? Long time. Whoa. See, what's nice about this one, though, is that animals like to hide down there. It's nice and safe. Yeah, it's 
cover. So we had old ones. We're going to pick on a young one because this is diversity too. So we have the spruce here. Wow, these have some ace on them. Todd. Good old Morheim spruce. Just a minute, let me go, David. Sorry. Uh, and then, this looks like a spruce, right? Mm -hmm. But it's a fir. So, I'm sitting here grabbing it. That's what I do with the students. Grab a spruce with one hand and grab a fir with the other, and which one's softer? Fur. Yeah, the fir is. It has the flat needles, and they're soft. And when they grab the spruce, it bites them a little bit because of the pointed needles. No scent. So that's an ID thing for you. When it comes to these, they look like they're spruce, but if they're flat and soft, needle, they're furs. We don't use enough furs, and this is one that everybody should use, is Korean fur. It does so, really well for us. And it gives us some diversity, and we still kind of get the same effect. What so, part of Korea is it from? Uh, Northern Korea. And there's no scent to this? No. But it does have kind of a lighter, whiter bark. Does it age well? Yes. Yep. It's a nice landscape plant. So that's kind of the new plant for the day. The Korean fir. Where finally we get to talk about another conifer, right? <laughs> what is that? What is it? We're going to detour and go to a shrub real quick. Because how many times do you get a Korean spice by Burnham that's just coming into bloom? So this is one of my favorite viburnums. I like all kinds of viburnums too. And you'll probably get the gist that I like everything. Um, it has leaves and bark and all that. So I want you to go ahead and get a whiff of this. It has a spicy scent, and David's going to be our first to try it out. What do you think? I don't, I can't smell the spice. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but very fragrant shrub is what I'm getting at. Oh, hold it. Todd? Todd? About right in here is how big it gets. So we're like seven plus. You can go ahead and prune on it. After it flowers. What did you say the name of this plant was? Korean Spice by Burn. Oh. Yeah, that's information because it's just. Can you smell it? Yeah. yeah. Does it tend to release its fragrance in the morning and the evening, or is it just all day? I kind of see it all day. The problem is, this might only last a week. So at home, I have this outside of my windows at home, and I'll crank open the windows when it's in bloom and it comes in the house. Yeah. What kind of spices is it used in? It's, the, it's for the scent, so it's not an actual spice. And then we had a good question. All right, I only want it to stay this big, right? And that's the way I'd want it, too. It will get up in the seven-foot range. So how do you go ahead and prune this thing? You see those shoots that don't have any flowers on them? Mm -hmm. So you wait till it's flowering, and that's when you prune. Right now, go in there, and those shoots that are taken off, and they're renegades, I call them. They're taken off, like this one here. I go ahead and prune them back. And then these that flower will maintain the flowers, and we'll keep the height down. Because there's nothing worse than somebody pruning your free and spice by burning in the wintertime and cut all your flowers off. Yeah. How is that bad? You don't have any flowers. <laughs> when, when is the correct time to prune right. a white, white yellow? Like after it flowers, too. Yeah. Yeah. I do that for all the flowering shrubs. Wait till it flowers, do your pruning. Or when it's flowering, do your pruning. Or do some pretty white bush in the back after it flowers. Nice plant. Really nice plant. Down here, when they, the spirea one year, they pruned it. It was just gorgeous. They just whacked it all off. I mean, yeah. what in the world are they thinking about? <laughs> yep. so, no matter what, we always do some of those mistakes. That's why in class we're always, like one student goes, why do you repeat everything ten times and go over and over again? I said, because you're going to do it. <laughs> I know you're going to do it. And then I can say, how many times did I say that? Because <laughs> I did the same thing. 
All right, the last one here is the magnolia. So we had the magnolia we started with up there, and this one, and this one's starting to get some flowers open there, but it was damaged. In the winter? Yes, that last snow is where I saw it damaged. I think it was swelling at the time that we had that cold snow that we had, and it just was enough where it damaged the flower buds. And that's so, what we run into with So magnolia. the heavy snow did the damage? Yeah, the cold did. So I'm going to take this one and sacrifice it. So the magnolia bud has this nice, big, fuzzy outer covering on purpose because it helps protect it. The flower bud on this plant is formed in August of the previous year. So these buds were formed to flower in August of 2013 to flower now. So it has to get through the whole winter of not getting damaged, and this one didn't do it, to go ahead and flower. So when I kind of peel this one back, I will probably see where there's some brown in here, and it definitely is doing that, to the brown inside there, that's cold damage. So you will have a few buds that make it through, but the majority are gonna uh -huh. be. Actually, it'll save it some energy, so it'll leap out fine. And then that energy and what it'll go ahead and produce this year, you'll probably have a fantastic display next year because it saves some energy. Yours got hit too this time. It was out already. Yeah, it, there's no rhyme or reason, and it can be microclimates. People have protection on one area their house. There's a neighbor that has a huge one that is really big and it's really big. Is that a magnolia tree or is it a tulip tree? It's a magnolia. Yep. Because tulip tree won't flower here till the end of May, beginning yeah. of June. And is they anybody yeah. seen tulip tree flowers? They're, they're kind of hard to see because they're way up in the tree always, yeah. but they look like a tulip flower, yes, they so they're a lot different than this one. So this one's a lot bigger, and the other one's tough. It gets to be a big tree. And you can find them in the nurseries. The problem with the tulip trees in the nurseries is uh, they're all that upright, like that uh, English oak was. They're, they keep propagating the one that's really narrow because everybody's afraid of getting them big. And I know we have limited space in our yards and in our urban areas, so the upright ones are more popular because of that. But the actual species, natural habit of it is more broad, and I think it looks better. How are we doing on time? Whitney, are we on time? It looks like we have about 12 minutes. 12 minutes? Just enough time to walk back. <laughs> We're right in there. I have a question. Yeah. Last summer when we lost all those trees, was there a specific variety of tree that was hit from the storm? What kind of tree? Uh, last in, we lost in the storm. In the storm, yeah. Here, yeah, on campus. Storm. Lost quite a few over by the flagpole and along the parking lot. Yeah. Oh, you mean was there any rhyme like, or reason? Yeah, or? was there any like, particular tree? No, trees that, that were more vulnerable? It was that weaker? event. But, yeah, it, the trees that are the most vulnerable, of course, are the ones that have. We're looking, I'm looking up here. See those trees that have been pruned up to be so narrow and everything? Yeah. Yeah. Those are more vulnerable okay. because of the way the branch angles are and all of that. These guys are lower than Yeah. Uh, but the way that event was, that was strange anyway because of what kind of went on here. So I don't know if anything Sorry. would have been safe. But always it's branch angles and things like that. I'll look back over to that one hybrid uh, maple. Those are perfect branch angles for health. Yeah. Um, so when you have things like that, then you know it's safe. Are you planting more than usual in response to this? Yeah, yeah. They really up the tree plant. Yeah. 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 Well, this is such an old landscape that 
the original trees that form these colonnades and allays along the different driving areas and stuff. There's nothing wrong with the fact that they're just old and they're going out. Yeah. They're not going to live forever. There's species that really shouldn't have lived this long. And we're getting to that point where they have to be able to make right. Some of them are close to 100. Part of the original form. Those are the flowering pears. Inedible? They have fruit that's that big around. Really small. So yeah, you can eat them, but they don't do much for you. <laughs> they like make you choke? <laughs> well, they can produce a lot. So we'll head back up to the crook house here. Anybody has any questions? Go ask questions. <laughs> Where at? Oh, wow. Let's see, let's so go down here. Kind of like the red, but they aren't red. You know, the bark and the, and the, the, the way it would look right now, but it would be a bright green right now. And it's a maple. And it's a maple. It's, it's a it's Norway. Is it? Yeah. It's a maple. It's a maple. It's like, I'm like, it's definitely not a silver. The bark is all wrong. And the Smoother. structure, it's, it's got a bark like this. Yep. Yeah. And it doesn't grow, it, it shapes like this a lot. I want to hear what's going on, but I'm like, good yes. climbing tree. Yes. yes. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, if it's green, the green flower, that's a Norway. Thank <laughs> you. 